coming up this week on Transworld Sport. We catch up with Rafael Nadal, the tennis ace who we first met as a teenager. In Germany, Drone Racing's Champions League comes to a climax. We head to the Antarctic for the annual ice marathon. And we touch down in DR Congo, where sport is helping people to change their lives for the better. As 2017 drew to a close, Transworld Sport headed to the Spanish island of Mallorca to catch up with an old friend of this show and one of the sporting world's biggest names. Tennis star Rafael Nadal was hosting his annual golf fundraiser with Jose Maria Olazabal. Despite an ongoing knee injury curtailing Nadal's season at the ATP Finals last November, the 31-year-old had plenty of high points in a very successful 2017. It was a year in which he returned to the world number one ranking. Yeah, it had been a very special one. Uh, very happy about all the things uh, that happened during the year. Uh, since the beginning, it had been a, a great year. I, I have been playing uh, very competitive in, in all the events that I played. So uh, I feel very happy. You know? Now is the moment to recover a little bit about the knee that I had uh, some issues at the end of the, of the year and just working on the recovery and try to be ready for the next one. Nadal experienced an injury-ravaged 2016 season, but he enjoyed a spectacular return to form last year. He reached his first Grand Slam final in almost three years at the Australian Open, where he lost in a five-set thriller to longtime rival Roger Federer. Tennis fans around the world were delighted to see the two greats back to their best on the big stage. The King of Clay then returned to his favorite surface. Rafa's season on the dirt culminated in an unprecedented 10th French Open title, one without dropping a set. The Spaniard also became the first male to win the same major 10 times. Trans World Sport first crossed paths with Rafa in Mallorca back in April 2003. Then aged just 16, he was in his first year on the professional ATP circuit, and he was dreaming of one day making it to the very top of the sport. My ambition is to go as far as I can in the game. I hope to become a good player. But at the moment, I'm only ranked 112th in the world, and there's still a long way to go. I know I've got to carry on trying to improve, and it's not going to be easy. Fast forward 15 years, and that teenager has gone on to win 75 ATP titles, and he's made 23 Grand Slam singles finals. Rafa can now look back and reflect on how successfully his career has progressed since we first met him. It's impossible, no, and it's impossible to, to think that in that moment I will be world number one any time in my career. No? But of course, it's, uh, it's difficult to think that at, the, at my age I still play in tennis, I'm very competitive. Um, you know, a lot of people say it when, when I was younger uh, that my career will be short because of my style of play, and uh, here I am now with 31, so having already uh, 13 years in a row finishing in the top eight of the ranking so it has been a, a very long career and i hope there is still still things to come no? so uh happy with all the things i i am enjoying uh, the the tennis and i want to keep doing alongside nadal throughout his career has been his coach uncle tony tony encouraged rafa to play left-handed despite him holding a pen with his right hand together the pair have remained in their Mallorcan family hometown of Manacor, and Rafa has lived as normal a life as possible, given his fame and success. At the end of the, of the day, it's, it's about yourself. You know? If you, of course, in some moments you need some help, uh, 
from different people but and you need to he hear different things but overall uh, is about yourself no? and if you are uh, enough fair with yourself uh, you know when you are doing the things well when you are not doing the things well no and it's not uh, the fault of your coach or your trainer or your physical uh, you know is yourself no so I, I i feel that i always had the right team right the right team around me and when the things are not going well I, I always have been very honest and say okay the things are not going well not because of you or you is because of myself no and and working that way i think the things are more easy as of this year tony nadal will no longer be traveling with his nephew to tournaments preferring to focus his time on coaching at the Rafael Nadal Tennis Academy in Manacor. Former world number one, Carlos Moya will become Rafa's lead coach. He has supported Nadal's career since the beginning and joined his coaching team in 2016. Back in 2003, Nadal was cautious to compare himself with someone of Moya's stature. I'm only 16 and I still have a lot to prove. I may be playing well at the moment, and things may be looking good. But the truth is that there are lots of people out there who started their careers well, only to fall away later. So you can't really compare me with someone like Moya right now. Nadal would surpass Moya's achievements. And despite a long list of injuries, he has gone on to become the youngest player to win the career Grand Slam. Rafa has also won two Olympic gold medals, the most recent of which was won in Rio two years ago, in the doubles with his childhood friend, Mark Lopez. Lopez was on hand here to help Nadal the day before his golf event got underway. Playing with Rafa, who played really well, and also with two professionals in Jose Maria and Jesus, was incredible for me. I told Rafa beforehand that my game isn't very good, but it was great fun. They all helped me out with some advice. I guess things went better for me in Rio than here because tennis is my real occupation. But still, playing with them was really fantastic. Competing and socializing alongside a close friend like Lopez is true to Nadal's character. Since his teenage years, Rafa has always made sure to surround himself with the people he trusts most. I think everybody has to do his own way. You, know? um, you need to learn from, from yourself, you need to learn from people who are around you. And uh, I feel very lucky that during all this, uh, these years I had uh, good people around me. You know? uh, uh, good people that really uh, help me in, in all ways. Uh, good family that supported me uh, in terms of education, in terms of values, in terms of uh, uh, work spirit. So I, I really feel very lucky about all the things that happened to me and I feel very lucky that uh, all the people that have been around me during all these years, that was a, a huge support and without them almost impossible to make that happen. In the final Grand Slam of 2017, Nadal claimed his third U.S. Open title at Flushing Meadows. That brought his total of major titles to 16, second only to Roger Federer, who has 19. Next week, the Australian Open gets underway in Melbourne. Rafa will be looking to pick up where he left off in the majors and win just his second Aussie Open title. And we wish the man from Mallorca well in his quest. And now it's time to test your knowledge with our sporting question. This week, the European Men's Handball Championship gets underway in Croatia. One of the nations hoping for success will be Iceland. Despite being one of Europe's smallest countries, Iceland have consistently punched above their weight in handball, which is their national sport. In 2008, the team famously came close to winning Iceland's first Olympic gold medal, but they lost in the final. The current team will go into the 2018 European Championship in good form, following victory over Sweden in a recent friendly. 
Kisley Forge Christian Soon made his debut in that match and has recently signed with one of Europe's top teams, German side Kiel. The 18-year-old is one of the rising stars of handball and is expected to dominate the sport in the years to come. And this leads us on to our question. We'd like you to name the man who is the most successful player in the history of the sport. We'll bring you the answer later. Drone racing is a sport on the rise. Established in 2013, competitors steer a radio-controlled drone around a course by wearing goggles which display a live image transmitted from the drone's onboard camera. The Drone Champions League is one of the sport's biggest competitions. This season, the world's top 10 teams faced each other in Germany, France, Liechtenstein, Belgium and Romania. The German capital, Berlin, hosted the final leg, which consisted of two standalone race days. On each day, teams made up of four pilots battled it out in a series of head-to-head -head knockouts. Czech outfit Rotorama led the overall standings going into the event, but Nextblades Racing from the UK and Flightduino Kiss Racing from Germany were still in contention. Everything is very open and it's going to be great, great playing, great battles and a lot of emotions. We are currently the leading team of the championship, so, uh, so far uh, the things were going really uh, well for us. And we are very curious how the two races will go here. Mainly we are trying to be as uh, consistent as possible. We don't want uh, to go for the win at all cost. Uh, we are more concentrating on not crashing and flying as uh, stable as we can. The drones can reach speeds of up to 140 kilometers per hour and the first across the line wins. With such high speeds and various obstacles to negotiate up and down the course, crashes are commonplace. Each head-to-head -head of the Drone Champions League is comprised of three heats. There are two one-on-one -on -one races in which teams must nominate a pilot to represent them. The final heat sees all of the pilots take to the course. In an opening day of racing in the German capital, league leaders Rotorama surprisingly crashed out in the quarter-finals. In their absence, home team Flightduino Kiss Racing took the victory with British team Nextblades propelling themselves to the top of the table with third spot. That's it, we took home third place, really happy with the result. It's, uh... It's given us a good opportunity tomorrow. We've, it's put us uh, at the top of the table, so um, our destiny is back in our hands. Uh, looking forward to, to getting back out there tomorrow and, and seeing what happens. The stakes were high for the second day of racing. If next blades could retain their place at the top of the leaderboard, they would take home a cheque for 50,000 euros. The team from the United Kingdom were unstoppable, making it through to the final. 18-year-old world champion Luke Bannister was in imperious form. Free flow, our final race of the season, ladies and gentlemen. All the drones are through the door, some of them not through the second ones. Max Postfold, Luke Bannister, backs down Luke Bannister, showing us what he can do with his world champion credentials. In the final big heat, Bannister took a commanding lead. Every drone was heading towards those doors at speed. Not every drone made it out of the other side. Five of them are out of this final race of DCL. What a shame. Brett is out of it. It is just Luke and Ashton now, the two youngest pilots on these teams. Both of them absolutely incredible. I hope Ashton's still with us. I'd love to see him finish the final race. He's not, oh no. 
It's just you now. Show us how it's done. Luke Bannister, 18-year-old British pilot, world champion. Luke Bannister was the only pilot to avoid the hazards and steer his drone home to win. His next Blades team took the series title in the process. The season's been really up and down and to finish here in Berlin with a win, not only in the, in the finals, but a win for the whole season is, uh, it's, it's unbelievable. It really is unbelievable. I mean, so many people have put in so much effort to get us here and, and we finally did it and we did it for everybody. So yeah, I'm so, I'm so happy right now. The EuroLeague is European basketball's premier club competition. Featuring 16 teams, it continues to go from strength to strength. Every team plays each other home and away in a single league format. The top eight teams progress to the playoffs before vying for a spot in the final four. The action is always dramatic and unpredictable. And for the men in charge of the on-court drama, well, they have to be on top of their game too. Hello, I'm Ilya Velosovic, EuroLeague referee since 2001. My name is Sretan Radovic. I am EuroLeague referee since season 7-8. Daniele Rezuelo, EuroLeague referee since 2001. My name is Matej Boltauser. I've been a EuroLeague referee since 2004. It's a high-pressure role for the men in the middle. We caught up with the unsung heroes of the EuroLeague to get an insight into what it takes to be an on-court official. I think it's not anybody can be a referee. It doesn't, doesn't matter if it's basketball, football or other sport. This, this is inside of us. The person got to have this feeling to be there and to be able to handle the plays, the game, players, coaches, atmosphere. You must feel what is going on. You must anticipate. You must read. We are not uh, for the home team. We are not for the visiting team. We must say what we see. We never stop learning. This is the most important. Even when you are 22 years in a top level, Officiality. Every year, you know new things. For me, number one is uh, to have uh, appropriate character, uh, to be modest, uh, but in the same time to be brave, to be smart, just to, to be able to react in a quick time in, in the best way. My name is Mehdi Difala. I come from France, and this is my first season as a EuroLeague referee. I'm Milan Edovic, and I'm rookie first year in EuroLeague basketball. Milan and Mehdi are the newest arrivals to big time officiating. You have to have the backbone. When I became referee, it changed my uh, look, um, look to the basketball. I didn't watch uh, basketball, but the referee, so. Well, I'm expecting to be uh, tested because uh, obviously I'm a new guy, they will see a new face, so uh, they will test me, they will see how far they can go with me. People sometimes can go crazy because there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, sometimes between coaches, players and referees. They don't know what I see on the court and they don't know that I have a specific angle that they don't have. When you want respect, you have to give you respect. In the relation of the players, coaches and the ref referee have to be, first of all, trust and respect on both sides. So for me, as, um, as a referee, I like to speak with the players and the coaches, but there is some line where nobody of us has to cross. And in a fast-paced game, keeping control is a real challenge. Players are getting faster, stronger, and we have to adapt. This is, uh, for me, one of the most amazing games in sport. I ask myself, oh, there is many, many easier, many better jobs, but I don't think that this is true. For me, this is the part of my life. It's like in my blood. You can be a rookie, you can be a veteran, but at the end of the day, you gotta go out there and perform.
probably the ultimate adventure. It's the coldest, driest, windiest marathon out there. When you consider how many people have been to Antarctica and what you need to come here, what better way to see Antarctica than to run on it? Antarctica is the planet's southernmost continent. This hostile terrain is indeed the coldest, windiest and driest place on Earth. And once a year it provides the location for one of the world's most extreme tests of endurance, the Antarctic Ice Marathon. It takes place at Union Glacier, 600 miles from the South Pole in West Antarctica. At the recent edition of the event, weather conditions were clear and a sense of excitement was felt by many of the competitors. I'm really looking for the challenge today. And it's nice weather here, great conditions, very cold, so let's do it. I'm just going to start off slow, see how everybody else is doing and just try to get my rhythm going and then just have fun. People always say with a marathon, what time are you aiming for, what time are you aiming for? I just say I'm just going for the time of my life and this is a once in a lifetime uh, experience. One, go. <laughs> Over 50 competitors from around the world took to the start line for this gruelling test of stamina. The race consisted of two laps of the course and there were numerous manned checkpoints to ensure competitor safety. For British Army Reserve Major Sally Orange, this race provided an opportunity to join the exclusive Seven Continents Marathon Club, dressed as a pair. Hopefully for me, this is going to be my seventh continent, so my aim has been to run seven marathons on seven continents, dressed as seven different pieces of fruit. This one's particularly challenging. Um, obviously, the, the environment's very, very different. I've gone from one extreme with my first marathon in Afghanistan, being very, very hot, to this one being not only cold, but windy. It's, it's probably the wind that's going to be more of a problem, particularly given the, the costume that I'm wearing is not the most aerodynamic. So that's, that's my main concern. To withstand the strong winds and minus 25 degrees Celsius temperature, runners were advised to dress head to toe in specialist polar gear. There were several rehydration stops en route, supplying races with hot drinks and snacks. Hydration was a challenge for the competitors, who had to manage the loss of sweat with staying warm. In this edition of the Antarctic Marathon, the winner was Frank Johansson from Denmark. The Dane took the early lead and finished in an impressive time of 3 hours, 37 minutes and 46 seconds. You are deep. Let's just pour the water. <laughs> Too bad it's over. This is the sad part. It's hitting in the finish line. Can I go one more lap? In second place was David Weeks from the United States. Great job, man. Hey, good job, man. David's fellow American, Kelly McClay, was the first woman home in under five hours. Oh, it's fantastic. The, the run was beautiful and it was everything I could have ever imagined it to be. As the day drew to a close, the frosty runners came in thick and fast. There was a real sense of achievement felt by all. That was one of the hardest finishes. The wind's hitting you, you're knackered, you're going uphill. But when you saw that, that finish line, I don't know where the energy came. That was phenomenal. I'm never going to forget that for sure. Thank you. <laughs> oh. That was extraordinary. 
such beauty and such pain all together. Fantastic, absolutely fantastic, loved it. Loved every minute of it, amazing. Our top five looks at some more of the remote locations we featured on the show. First up is the Marshall Islands. This collection of over 1,000 islands and atolls lies scattered across a vast swathe of ocean halfway between Hawaii and Australia. The people here are skilled sailors, and an outrigger canoe race is held on the country's national day. The Asaro Mudmen of Papua New Guinea are renowned for their ability with a bow and arrow. This Highland tribe are keen to preserve their cultural heritage and often organize a game which tests their skills as bowmen. In the Mongolian district of Hujert, temperatures rarely rise above freezing and they plunge to a savage minus 40 degrees Celsius in winter. But even in the harshest of conditions, football is still played outside using coal to mark out the pitch. Straddling the Arctic Circle, Greenland is the world's largest island, covering an area more than four times the size of France. The capital, Nuuk, hosted the recent Arctic Winter Games, which feature a wide variety of traditional pursuits. And finally, to the northwest Mexican state of Chihuahua. These rugged mountains are home to the Raramuri people. Raramuri means footrunner. The long distances between the remote communities have turned the locals into extraordinary endurance racers. The stunning Mexican resort of Los Cabos recently staged Act 8 and the season finale of the Extreme Sailing series. It's been a thrilling 10 months of high-performance catamaran racing. Famed for its beautiful beaches and perfect year-round weather, Los Cabos was an apt location for the final event. Taking part over four days of racing were eight teams from eight different countries. They battled it out on the water for a place on the podium. And with the overall series title at stake, the pressure was on for the crews. Frontrunner SAP Extreme Sailing Team had enjoyed an outstanding season. It will be difficult, you know, it's a double pointer, so everything is on stake and we have to sail really well here. But um, it looks like we have good breeze here for the first day, which does normally suit us well, so, um, so hopefully we can pull off a strong first day. Snapping at the heels of the leaders were Oman Air and Alingi. In order to claim the series title, both teams needed to put at least two boats between themselves and SAP and finish ahead of the other. Yeah, um, what I know about Los Cabos is good, good weather, uh, some tricky win for the final act, it's double point race, so everything is possible. Pressure's all on SAP and the other boys, we're sort of a few points behind with nothing to lose, so we're, yeah, relaxed and ready. Day one and the Act 8 opener didn't disappoint with the waters of Los Cabos delivering perfect foiling conditions. As racing commenced, both Oman Air and Alingi kept the race for the title wide open. Phil Robertson and his Oman flagged boat were at the top of the leaderboard at the close of racing on day one. Seven points clear of the Swiss outfit, Alingi. Adam Minoporio's SAP were in third, despite managing to break the speed record for the season, hitting 33.7 knots. On day two, Alingi looked unstoppable, picking up five race wins in a row. 
They almost completed a whitewash, but for Oman Air snatching victory from the Swiss in the final leg of the closing race. Roman Hagara's Red Bull sailing team bounced back from a poor first day to leapfrog NZ Extreme Sailing and the Land Rover Academy team. Oh, we're just trying to win races. We're not too worried about the overall scoreboard, yeah. you know. Maybe next year we can try and get on the podium overall, but this year, just trying to improve and, and get close to the top. We were just on the on the back side of the of, of the groups, and um, yeah, it's a tough day. So we're uh, we're looking looking for a better one tomorrow. At the halfway point, Alinghi held pole position, six points ahead of Oman Air. SAP sat in third and held on to the lead in the overall series standings. Day three, so call it moving day, you know. The leaderboard's going to change a lot, I think, and if there's some wind and we've got some races, so that's an important one. And sort of you want to try and go out there and solidify your position going into tomorrow because the races get a bit, bit less and uh, more important. Day three and the winds arrived on cue, treating fans to yet more world-class racing. In the opening race, SAP Extreme Sailing team recovered from a disastrous start to take victory from Oman Air and Red Bull Sailing. Meanwhile, Alinghi's overnight six-point lead looked to be completely undone with an uncharacteristic last place. However, the Swiss team quickly re-established itself on the top of the leaderboard with another bullet in race 14. It would all come to a head in the penultimate race of the day. Well, there's some big gusts coming down from the top of the course onto Red Bull, onto Alinghi. Oman Air coming in from the right. They are attacking very close, but the Swiss team Alinghi now taking the victory as we go into the final very short reach into the finish line. It's up on the foils for the Swiss team. Arno Sarafagas not quite able to hold it. He is now just a couple of bow lengths away from the finish line, and Arno Sarafagas takes victory in race 15, and it all coming down to those final final few seconds with Oman Air. Uh, I think the winning move is just to start clear and uh, try to shoot the best sail at the, at the right time and uh, just uh, play the shift uh, when, you, when you can and then uh, everything is come together there. Alinghi started the final day still ahead of Oman Air. But more importantly for the two boats, SAP occupied third spot, 12 points ahead of Red Bull sailing in fourth a crucial position if the Danish flag SAP were to secure overall victory. Yeah, I know he's in a pretty good spot for a nice lead, but it's going to be a tough ask for him to keep his lead and to put us behind the Red Bull. It's not an easy job. And uh, for Phil, his even harder job, he's got to get ahead of Alinghi and put us behind Red Bull. So I think we'll see Phil go for Alinghi and get the uh, first half of his job done and then he'll worry about us after. Uh, everything going to change during the day. Uh, see how the, the first race goes, see the point, and uh, then we're going to need to go for one boat on, on, or the other. I'm not sure I know a competitor that wants to come second. So um, look, we're out there to fight today and we're going for it all and hopefully we can get all the chocolates. A storming start to the final day by Oman Air saw them take two bullets and a third place, narrowing the gap on act leaders Alinghi to just six points. SAP Sailing stayed out of trouble and maintained third place as the boats headed into the final double points race. SAP's overall series lead was safe, but the Act 8 win was still up for grabs. For Oman Air, the race for the act win was lost in the final downwind leg. Great job by Alinghi to accelerate there. Oh, big luck, big luck here by Oman Air. Well, Alinghi coming into this, Oman Air attacking over. It looked very close to me, and Oman Air now have lost control. Alinghi have absolutely, I mean, they have done what Phil Robertson has struggled to do. It was all about getting boats between Oman Air and Alinghi. It's happened, but in reverse of the way Phil Robertson wanted. Yeah, good point, you're right. You're right, they needed three boats in between, but this is not the way they wanted it to go. Alinghi now coming across.
across the line. Arno Sarafagas looks behind him, sees the damage that he has dealt Phil Robertson and Omar Nair. It is clear water between him and the finish line. And Alingi comes across the finish line in second place. That is going to wrap up Act 8 Los Cabos. Alingi take the win here in Los Cabos. SAP Extreme Sailing Team comes across the line in third place and they finish out their incredible assault on the 2017 Extreme Sailing Series and they will leave this year as champions. Celebrations all round and it was there really any doubt, a formidable performance. It's just fantastic um, first season in the Extreme Sailing Series with a great team that's been well organised and to be able to clinch the win has just been awesome. For us it's, uh, it's great to, to end up the, the season second, uh, we were third uh, almost uh, the whole season so it's great to come back here and uh, finishing the job really well and uh, it's perfect to end up the, the year with a, with a win and uh, it's really good for next year, hopefully uh, we can uh, come back and beat SAP. There's a lot of great people who sailed in this series in the past and it's really, really it's really great to be able to be amongst the uh, winners of this series and to um, have a lot of fun while doing it. And now it's time for the answer to this week's sporting question. Earlier in the show, we asked you to name the most successful handball player of all time. The answer is Nikola Karabatic. Having moved to France from Serbia aged four, Nicola has always represented his adopted nation, and he has helped Le Bleu enjoy an unprecedented level of success. Two Olympic golds, four world championships, and three European championship titles to be exact. Between 2008 and 2010, Karabatic's brilliance on the court helped France become the first men's team to hold the Olympic, world, and European titles simultaneously. Now 33, and still a dominant force in the game, the Frenchman has made 273 appearances for his national team, scoring over 1,000 goals. Karabatic has also been named World Player of the Year a record three times. Transworld Sport recently made the journey to the Democratic Republic of Congo. The African country was formerly known as Zaire. In the east of the nation, in the North Kivu region, is the city of Goma, home to just over one million people. Goma lies on the northern shore of Lake Kivu, close to the border with Rwanda, and it was once where this land's former president and dictator, Joseph Mobutu, had his summer palace. Goma's recent history has been blighted by human tragedy. 20 years ago, the arrival into Goma of over a million refugees fleeing the Rwandan genocide was the spark for the first and second Congo wars. The surrounding countryside became a base for rebel groups, and in 2012, the M23 rebels occupied the city for almost a year. Since then, the UN and numerous NGOs have worked hard to restore peace to this troubled region and establish some sort of economic stability. Hey, I was here. I was right here when the rebels came to remove Mobutu. They came to recruit us saying they needed child soldiers, calling us Kadogo, meaning child soldier. From here, we were then taken to Entebbe, where we were trained. During all of the training, they would keep telling us how we just had to remove Mobutu. That's all they said. Balizi Bagunda, or Kiba Mango as he's also known, fought as a child soldier in the Congo Wars, and he was witness to many horrific crimes. He lost his left eye to shrapnel during the war, and with it, his dreams of becoming a professional boxer. However, when he left the army and returned to his home in Goma, 
he was determined that the next generation would be spared the life he had endured. He set up a boxing gym in the terraces of Goma's oldest football stadium for the street kids and for those fleeing the rebel army recruiters. Most of these kids are orphans, survivors, child soldiers or street kids. They have to work in order to live, eat and sleep well, just like my elders taught me. Even though I left the army, I still knew how to work by using my hands. I decided to train them in boxing so that I could help them think for themselves and keep fit. And as I'm a car mechanic, I've taught them about this as well, so that they can earn some money. Jobs are extremely hard to come by in Goma. Around 80% of the people here are unemployed. By teaching these youngsters boxing and training them as car mechanics, Kiba Mango hopes that they can avoid the temptations of crime or the prospect of joining one of many militia groups surrounding the city. Boxing is one of the most popular sports in DR Congo. The legendary 1974 heavyweight title fight between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman, billed as the Rumble in the Jungle, was held in Kinshasa, the nation's capital. Ever since then, Congo's boxing gyms, like Kiba Mango's, have attracted young aspiring fighters with dreams of glory. <laughs> In our area, we have suffered a lot of conflicts and wars. So I got involved with boxing to express what I feel in my heart. I also hope that one day I can help and save others from the pain I have experienced in life. We were sleeping on the streets and just generally having a miserable life. Occasionally, we would be fighting with our friends, and then Kiba Mango came and found us. He would take us out for runs around town and talk to us one to one. He told us to stop the life we were leading and to take up boxing. He said it would help us in the future. Decades of fighting between government and rebel forces in this region has left a generation of orphans. Promotion Basket, or PJB, was set up 11 years ago by a small group of Goma basketball players. They saw the sport as a valuable tool of engagement for the children whose lives had been so badly damaged by the conflict. Along with boxing, basketball is hugely popular in DR Congo. There are currently two Congolese players competing at the very top of the sport in North America's NBA. Dr. Dady Sale works for the Basketball Project. Whatever the situation, in times of conflict, we think that it's important to try and teach the kids. Our program didn't stop during the war. It may have stopped for two or three days, but afterwards we carried on. Quite simply, we had to prevent the children from joining militia groups. Kids need an education, and this is what PJB did with over 1,000 children. We wanted them to avoid being contaminated by war and going off to join the armed groups. Promo Jean Basquet is active all over Goma, working with thousands of kids. Christian Shamamba lost his father at a young age, and with his mother working in Rwanda most of the year, it's up to him and his sister to help run the household. He credits the program with giving him a focus to his life. It has changed my whole life. Because before I joined PJB, I had no direction, and I would get into trouble quite a lot. But when I joined, I changed and started socialising and talking to people. I stopped all the bad and stupid things that I was doing. I suddenly had a focus. Now I believe that I'm a respectable person. Without a doubt, I'm going to stick with PJB and hopefully play for them in the future. Girls are encouraged to participate too, and PJB has the most successful women's team in the city. 
thousands of children from the age of three upwards have been through the programme. PJB has been a real vehicle for social change and for greater gender equality in the Goma region. I have such a determination to succeed and a real love of basketball. When I'm playing, I feel completely relaxed on the court. I am taking it very slowly, but my wish is to get good enough in the sport so that it can take me to the United States of America or any other country. As popular as basketball is in Congo, there are no professional players based here, with payment to players still illegal. This means that most of the country's leading talents are forced to leave the country. Many go the few miles across the border to neighbouring Rwanda, where the standard of living is more than twice what they can expect in Goma. And for the very best here, the possibility of playing in Europe and even the NBA remains the ultimate dream. Personally, I'm convinced that one of our players will end up playing in the NBA. Most of the players from here develop in a good way and they make a difference in the world. This is my motivation for coaching them. They all have the skills to play and you can see that every day. I already know that one or two players are almost banging on the doors of NBA selection. PJB's senior teams have supplied three players to the under-18 national squad and there is a constant stream of young talent being discovered here. Congolese NBA star Bismack Biyombo, who plays for the Orlando Magic, makes regular visits here and he's also now on PJB's board. Despite all the difficulties that Goma has been through, such as wars, genocide, poverty and even volcanic eruptions, it's important to note that I am very positive and optimistic. You can see positivity right through the PJB programme with kids who didn't go to school, ending up at university. Despite everything, we believe that through coaching, sport and education, it can change these children's lives. Some here still look across Lake Kivu with envy towards Rwanda, with its relative economic prosperity and political stability. Yet for many in Goma, there remains a fierce determination to create change at home, and sport will continue to play a vital role in this. Coming soon on the show. We're in Switzerland to see who will be crowned king and queen of the fat bikes. And we see what it takes to make a tennis champion with world-renowned coach Gabe Jaramillo. Don't forget you can keep up to date with us on Twitter, YouTube and Instagram.